Hi, I'm Asif Khan. Uh, you're watching Game Trader, a show about investing in games. I have a very special guest with me today. This is Justin Bailey from FIG, the uh, crowdfunding company that gives you a little bit of equity sometimes. So thanks for being here, Justin. Yep. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for coming. Oh, yeah, no problem. We're actually at FIG headquarters. And, uh, you know, FIG is a company that has... Uh, kind of figured out a way to, I'm not saying you're getting around a rule, but maybe the rule change uh, for unaccredited investors. Can you talk about uh, what rule changes or what kind of leniency was given to you to even let this company exist in, in 2016? <laughs> so the Jobs Act uh, came about a few years ago, and it actually allows for non-accredited people to participate in private companies. Um, it allows us actually to solicit um, securities that to these non-accredited investors. Um, there's a couple, the, the form of the Jobs Act is, is more about investing in those specific companies and buying shares, um, to which normally what happens is investors would only get paid on terminal value, meaning like the company gets acquired. Um, for video game companies, of course, that's like 1% to 2%. Um, ends up maybe happens seven to ten years if people decide to do that so um, I don't think that's a, a very advisable route but so we looked at it and we're like hey what if people could actually invest in the revenue stream of these games um, and so the way it ends up working is like you know you would you would back a project you buy a security that's actually tied to the revenue stream of the game and when that game comes out you can actually start to to get receipts from that game um, and we thought that was the way that, that um, the Jobs Act uh, could be used in games and, and and uh, kind of fix, I think, what I think is wrong with uh, crowdfunding. So, you know, that's interesting you mentioned revenue. Uh, I think a, a common misconception is that FIG creates a shareholder base and then you have uh, participation in the earnings of the company. What you're saying is it's actually based on sales, correct? That's right. So it's like it's not actually, um, so you invest in a revenue stream. Um, you don't actually invest in a game. So that's, that's like the first thing we always have to, to clear up. And I mean, we got to get out there and communicate. It's a new model. We're a small company. Um, we're kind of pioneering new territory. Um, but it's really exciting the potential that that opens up because, you know, I mean, crowdfunding uh, before was, you know, you, it's a way for, for creators to get money from their fans. And I think that's one reason why it really wasn't that repeatable and why it's been declining year over year is because there was never this mechanism to allow fans to get money from the creators. And so, you know, now in this with game shares, which we registered um, with SEC, you know, there is that chance to invest in the revenue streams of the games that um, people are passionate about. Yeah, because uh, I think a lot of people who don't really understand your platform, they're like, uh, how can you guarantee that the companies will act in a fiduciary role to the FIG uh, backers? Uh, I think that allowing it to be revenue based instead of earnings, because my main concern was, how you know i didn't realize that it was revenue um that you know a company can manipulate their income statement to always run at a loss or at zero yeah. so they don't have to distribute earnings i think what you've done is figured out a way to be like no you're going to distribute x amount of revenue yeah. i guess my question is if a company isn't profitable while generating revenue do they still have to distribute uh payments to the fig uh backers yeah. yes because it's tied to revenue so it, it, it's not profit it's uh it's a revenue share. So the way it works with us is developers actually sign, they sign a licensing agreement, um, which gives us a right to a certain amount of revenue. Uh, we have no IP ownership, no creative control, but when that revenue comes in, we have the right to that, and then we, we collect that revenue and then pay it out to our investors. Very cool. And um, I'm sure that uh, a lot of game companies are looking at you guys more than Indiegogo and Kickstarter these days. How do, would an indie go about uh, pitching to you? And then what is your process for looking at various campaigns and judging is it worth uh, doing or not? Yeah, I mean, we look at ourselves as a label, um, or I don't really see ourselves as competing with Indiegogo and Kickstarter. I know that, that we make we get a lot of like uh, comparisons, but we couldn't take all the projects, even if we wanted to. Um, and I don't think all the projects make sense for to have investment, to have this investment component. Um, but people go to it's pitches at fig.co. Um, you go there, and then the main things that we're looking at is. Um, you know, are people capable enough to deliver and, um, you know, do they plan basically um, to, to deliver what they're, what they're saying. So um, it's, it's more about that. It's more about competency um, and, um, and, and, and 
you know, not scamming, basically. It's hard to get around that, but <laughs> um, we, we can't, obviously, because we're doing investment and we're taking that investment on, um, we want to make sure everything's on the up and up. And so there's a huge amount of trust in the system um, and that exists, especially with uh, you know, having taking on this investment money. Um, we don't make money off running crowdfunding campaigns, which is why I don't think of ourselves as a crowdfunding platform. Um, all of our upside is basically based on the, the title performing well. And so when the developer and when investors, um, when are, they're seeing receipts and they're seeing returns, is when we see returns. And all of our upside is based off that. And it's interesting you said once the, the, the game is uh, making revenue, is there any kind of recourse then for people who do uh, choose to do the revenue share backing? Uh, recourse how so? Like, okay, you put $1,000 in, let's say that they, there was some kind of uh, dubious activity that led to the company not uh, not getting to market or maybe they they did it in a way where the com the, the game failed how you know is there any because in Kickstarter there's no recourse uh, you know if you back something and it doesn't get to market yeah. tough is there any is it is it similar in this sense it's probably it's probably helpful to say too that um, so we're we're a de facto public company um, a de facto public uh, CEO um, because we have that SEC uh, registered security so we do have a whole list of risk factors that could potentially happen that are in our SEC filing um, which you can check but um, for us you know that's why um, when we get pitches in um, we it, it's more on the front end that we're trying to keep bad actors um, from 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 basically getting on the platform um, than it is trying to do something after the fact. So because we don't have creative control, because we don't um, we don't have this rigid milestone structure, which is what I think is wrong with some of the publishing parts. Because like you know um, sometimes developers will spend up like 40 percent um, of the money they've raised, um, or even the money they're getting from the publishers to manage the publisher. And like we don't have that. We want that to go towards the game, towards them, their creative vision, and making and delivering on what what they want to do. Um, but what that also means is you know we don't have um, we don't have as much control of the process in that. And so it's even more important that the people we work with are people we trust and people who have a, um, a track record, a proven track record. Got it. And uh, it's definitely a case-by-case -case kind of basis with these campaigns. Do the do you work with the company to decide what percent revenue share is going to be done? Is it is it really is it rigid, or is it each campaign offers a different kind of revenue share? Yeah, it's campaign by campaign. Um, there's a lot of stuff we use that informs us on what we think might be. Um, you know, fair for investors, um, but also like, um, in a way, you know, investors come, they see the terms, they make the decision on whether they want to participate or not. And I use investors very broadly here. So this is like, you know, fans and, you know, credit investors alike. Um, but you know, one thing we look at um, is like budget, like what's the total budget that's being funded by crowdfunding? What's the commercial potential of this? How far along are they in development? Is it new IP? These are all factors that go into forming that process. Um, and you know, as we do more and more, we start to get kind of kind of see more consistent consistency on um, you know where we think um, uh, it, the, the, the term should be and so um, so that's just happened we've um, even in doing this and like the, the campaigns we've done now um, we're getting better at it um, as we go and so it, there's there's an iter iterative process to it yeah because this is a very new field that you guys are kind of trailblazing in right yeah that's very true <laughs> uh, so you know just kind of wondering because a lot of companies have revenues you know it's not just gaming are you guys thinking of uh, branching out into uh, other industries? Um, no, right now we're not, um, because all the experience of our team is in games. Our passion is in games. Um, that's you know my background is is with that. So um, it is interesting though if you look at the security, um, we're the only like SEC registered security that's actually tied to revenue stream of a consumer product. That's a that's a whole you know word like mouthful of words, but um, it's pretty it's pretty exciting. Um, and you know, one thing we've seen so far is there is a lot of appetite. There's a lot of interest in participating in the investment side of things. Um, but as much as we're pioneering, like the people that are with us right now, we can tell um, they're early adopters, and um, which is interesting because if you look at the results we've had with early adopters, and you know, once we start making returns to people, um, and I'm looking forward to, you know, I, th I think we can announce something on those lines very soon. Um, you know, I think people, you'll stop seeing it just being the early adopters and you'll start getting more mass adoption of, of this model in video games. Kind of uh, branching off your comments on mass adoption, I think uh, one, of my, uh, one of my video editors, Greg Burke, was uh, trying to back a, a campaign and he was kind of taken back by the sign-up process on your website. 
Is there something you guys can do to help educate your users, or your potential users, to make them less wary? You know, it's not that I'm not I'm not trying to spin this in a way that you guys are some sort of monolith, but I think for a lot of our viewers and a lot of our readers, it's just kind of uh, it's I think especially given the the past bubbles, the tech bubble and the housing bubble, uh, seeing those those crashes, I think people are more risk averse than they had been in the past and you're a brand new platform so i think and, the, and we've seen failed kickstarter campaigns we've seen failed indiegogo campaigns uh is there a way to help your potential mass market uh be less skeptical is it, or through education or what is it that you could do to help people uh, sign up there's a lot there there's some things like we are just a small startup of 10 people um, we do need a better job communicating one thing we we're, we're getting out here getting on camera um, getting active on the forums um, we don't even have a full-time community manager yet so you know we actually have a posting if anybody wants to, to apply please do <laughs> um, hey, a job <laughs> yeah a job um, so we're expanding but um, there's a lot new of what we're doing there's a lot of communication we need to do um, we need to do it over and over and over again. Um, the process that you're going through is meant to have some friction in it. It's meant to be a little bit scary because you're investing in the amounts that are are um, being entrusted with us right now. Like we want people to, to think twice about it and and to really think like, hey, there's you know this is a serious transaction that you're making. It's not just um, if you want to just go and buy an early copy of the game and comment on it and give feedback to the developer. That's the reward side, and that's totally cool. And a lot of people right now are like, you know, hey, I want to support it through that. I'm not comfortable yet with the investment. And to that, we're like, yeah, we totally understand because it is new and some people just want to see the whole thing play out and I don't fault anybody for that. And I would actually encourage people that are hesitant to go that route for now. That makes sense. You know, it's kind of funny. Like uh, I, I brought up uh, Indiegogo and Kickstarter a lot. Another uh, crowdsourced uh, funding thing is uh, Patreon. Yeah. Um, and that's not necessarily gaming. That's more game personalities and gaming websites like you know the kind of funny guys and stuff like that are you guys interested at all in helping the games media help raise funding through revenue share um i haven't really thought about that that's that's a new one um well it's free you can have my idea for free and then and then maybe shack news will use you guys to raise some funds i mean hey you know the interesting thing about game shares is you get the opportunity to um to to tie something, tie a share to a, re a revenue share um, of, of a product, right? And so um, the ways that that could be used are very interesting for us. Like say, um, you know, say for your artists or your animators that are actually working on it, if they can kind of get game shares, um, they get their salary, but they also know that, you know, years from now, they'll also be getting some, you know, a check coming in. That's, that's pretty kind of, that's, that's very interesting. Um, other applications of it, um, you know, we're just trying to, we're just, we're, we're thinking through the whole um, way that that could change how people uh, approach making games. And, uh, you know, so I, I view those those three in kind of a basket, Patreon, Indiegogo, and Kickstarter. Do you guys view yourselves as an evolution of that or something completely different and new? Totally different. Um, as a matter of fact, like, I think crowdfunding is pretty much synonymous with Kickstarter. Um, and it should be because it's like the earliest instance of that. Um, but we look at ourselves as community publishing. And so um, that whole idea that we're not making money off doing crowdfunding campaigns, um, we're not doing like crowd, you know, a thousand crowdfunding campaigns. That's that's not what we're, we're at. Um, what we're at is like getting community involved and helping select games, um, having the ability to um, financially participate, um, be able to give feedback, uh, which which is happening. But but also once the game launches, um, being able to, to help promote. Like we're going to actually you know solicit fans to be like, hey, you know help help us promote this game, help us get the word out. Um, and now it's in their financial best interest as well. I mean the thing I think that um, is really important to talk about is why people are doing this. Um, and one of the reasons is, is they're, they're, they're technically, first and foremost, they want this thing to exist, this game to exist, and they're passionate about it. Um, but they're also very, um, they're happy that there's an opportunity now for them to get a return. Because um, what's been happening in crowdfunding, and it's down about 60%, if you look at that, um, is that about a third of the people are like, hey, I'm just gonna wait, you know, it's, it's, it's a long process, we're just gonna wait for the games to come out. And that's totally cool. But um, the other, like, you know, another 
big portion of that are the 500 and up tiers. And you know, I think some confusion existed with when, when crowdfunding was taking off and whether that was investment. Um, it absolutely is not. It's a donation. It's charity. And so um, people who used to participate at those high levels aren't anymore. However, those people actually are willing to do investment. And so they now have an opportunity to get their money back on it. They're like, hey, they're, they're passionate about this. They can come in at the levels they were actually doing during kind of the heyday from 2012 to 2015. Yeah, I think the poster child of what you're talking about was the Oculus campaign and how everyone felt burnt when they got acquired for $2 billion, which ended up being $3 billion of all things. Yeah. Yeah, right. But now now some of that's going back, right? So Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, now it's going to Zenimax of all places. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, Oculus. Uh, now, I had a question from uh, Nick DiMucci, who's an independent developer. He did Demons with Shotguns. He said, I'd be interested in the marketing services for indie devs, specifically average ROI for a two-day launch campaign. Their site only lists the ROI for two very popular games, which probably isn't the normal return. So do you have, like... Uh, how, how do you guys pitch uh, your service to people and yeah. do you have a I guess you don't have a whole lot of data yet to be like this is our average ROI I do have a lot of data oh, okay. um, and I can tell you some of that data um, so um, like we, have, we, we do marketing during campaigns we also do marketing when the game is launched now none of our games have launched yet so we were helping out some that had used crowdfunding before like Hyperlight Drifter and Duskers um, basically what that was we were trying to we did a tracking pixel on Steam and we wanted to go and see hey if we go all the way down to purchase what's our ROI using the marketing data that we're, we're gathering um, and this is all part of the community publishing piece is that by doing these campaigns we get these titles we get more uh, attention to these titles but we also get a lot of marketing data that we can actually use um, to help the titles sell better when they come out because that, that's in our interest that's how we make money right um, so what we did is we saw some very good early returns the 700% ROI and the 300% ROI 700% hyperlight drifter 300% on duskers um, and I sat down with uh, with my board and I'm like this could be a separate company as a matter of fact we could just do this um, but then the decision was is that um, it was taking us away from the core um, the core opportunity and so we actually put a halt on kind of doing our, our external marketing for right now um, and uh, but what I can tell you is we have data from the campaigns um, and most recently um, Psychonauts 2 we had about 700% ROI um, on the ad dollars we spent in the campaign uh, Pillars 2 actually outperformed it did over 800% ROI Jeez, yeah this is like unheard of in advertising and marketing so like um, one, of my, one of the people that's a contractor for us used to be um, uh, she used to be like one of the head people at Indiegogo for marketing and the previous high she told me she saw was 300% so like it's yeah it's it's insane these are insane numbers yeah. uh, and it kind of highlights the value of your platform I think well I think that's and I think what you know we looked at what was happening in crowdfunding it was like you know communities come in and they go out um, and that's because they're doing you know, a whole bunch of doing video games, they're doing uh, interpretive dance, they're doing like um, uh, taxidermy. Um, seriously, right? And so um, there's like, there's no, nothing unifying on that. So what we've been seeing is we have a newsletter and every single time we do a campaign it grows, but our engagement on that newsletter is incredibly high because it's just video games. And so people signing up for it, we're actually going to them with something they're already interested in, they've expressed interest. Um, besides that, every time we do a campaign, we get more marketing data. Um, and this is stuff like marketing data that you would get by running campaigns on, on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Um, nobody captures that. Or maybe the only people that do capture it is that one campaign. And so it's one-offs. Everything's a one-off. Whereas in us, we're growing that, that marketing data. Um, and then even more important, um, you know, we have this investor community. Um, and we have over like 6,000 investor signups. And those range from your average Jane or Joe all the way up to um, CEOs and multinational corporations and people in very key places in the game industry. Um, who we keep confidential because that's a confidential list. Um, but um, it's people you would actually want to have associated with your game. Um, and I think that's fundamentally, it, it hits on um, the Jobs Act and why I'm excited about it is um, in general, like investing in a company, the thing you don't want is to have a huge amount of people investing small amounts of money. But with entertainment properties and specifically video games, that's exactly what you want. You want a lot of people who are very passionate with an opportunity to get their money back who um, might help actually get the word out when, when the game launches. So I think it is the perfect application of the Jobs Act. Yeah, and I, I think you kind of, you, you have the nail on the head. When, when you're vested, 
when you're invested in a company or in a, in the revenue stream of the company, you're going to be an evangelist for that product. Yeah. You're going to get out there and be like, hey, you know what? Buy Psy- Psychonauts too because yeah. I'm going to get some money from it. Yeah, I mean, it's something like, um, you know, um, we're not as organized yet as we would like to get, but at some point in time, we'd like to put a press kit, press kit together, right? And this is uh, another example of, like the community publishing. is like when we go out with the press kit, we want to go out to the press, but we also want to send that press kit out, out to the investors and be like and treat them like hey help help us get the word out sure i want to kind of switch gears to talk about you guys as a business um your revenue model are, maybe you can say this maybe you can because i know you guys have some public company roles um are you profitable yeah. yeah so i mean we're we're a private company ourselves that raises from um from venture capitalists like uh for actual loose tooth which is the parent company to fig um, so, you know, they, our operations are funded mostly by that, um, right now, um, because this, it is a long cycle to get stand up, but, you know, we do have forecasts of when we're, we're going to start to become, um, self-sufficient, um, and that's exciting. And, and there is, there's a time in the future where i we've already actually raised enough money that if we stay on track, the track run now, that we actually don't need to raise any more money. And so, um, but these, these models, they, they take a while because you take money in, the games have to be developed and the games have to come out. So, um, and then, you know, we do have, um, so the way, the way it works, which is kind of interesting, um, we sign a licensing agreement, so we can basically work with any developer in the world. Um, but then when the game actually launches, um, you know, we're making our money off of if the game's doing well. So, um, but, you know, we actually are, ourselves have, have an opportunity to, um, to invest sometimes. So, on the same terms that investors invest in. So. So Fig can actually invest in some of the campaigns alongside the other investors. We can do that. Yep, well, that's cool. Um, you know, uh, one uh, it's James asked a question, uh, which you know it's it's kind of silly, but uh, are you guys in this for the long haul, or is you're already a subsidiary of a company? Are you looking to get bought out, or is this something where you want to do this for five, ten years and see where it goes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this um, this could fundamentally change how entertainment is published. Um, I think having the community at the center of something um, is where things need to go. And I mean, you and I were talking before. Um, Disney makes some amazing properties. Like, not to pick on any of the major publishers, but like, there is a lot of sequelitis going on. Um, there is a lot of rehashing of, of properties. And I think the creative risk taking, like something like this, um, allows people to to find the kind of the exact kind of entertainment they want to find, and for the people who create it to make it more meaningful um, and relate to people so I'm excited about that part because um, I you know I think I think if you go and you go to the top end and you're seeing these mold you know you know hundreds of million dollar budget things um, that's pretty much taken care of um, but these more meaningful more impactful experiences um, there's like there's not much of that uh, that exists right now very cool and um you know, I, I think it's. I think what you said about kind of rehashing. It seems like on Indiegogo and Kickstarter that they really play into that nostalgia factor more than what I've seen with your games. Uh, you know, like Pillars of Eternity. That's a game that you know came out a few years ago, but it's not like they're rehashing. Like, hey, we're going to reboot some game that came out in 1985. I think these are companies that they could have tried to go to private markets to raise funding, but I think what you ended up giving them was a better way to raise funds and uh, i think pillars is a great example because they did way better than expected right yeah they did a lot better um i mean the interesting thing for us is like describing the you know how we make money so um the reward money goes straight to the developer we don't even take a cut of that so um we are seeing you know about two to three times the potential of whatever you could make on indiegogo or kickstarter um we can raise two to three times that amount um because we have the investment component as well um, which is interesting. So, you know, I think, you know, people can, um, and I've often said this, by the way, is if you even just sell, if anybody's raising more than a million dollars, like crowdfunding, like I would almost want them to sell, like be required they sell one share because by selling one share, like they've made a commitment to transparency um, and accountability that they would never have if they're just taking reward dollars. So That's right. So going on the transparency, uh, uh, so what kind of, because they're not publicly traded companies, a lot of these guys. What kind of reporting standards exist uh, for these companies? Because clearly, it's going to be revenue based. Are we, as a backer, are you going to, or as a investor, are you going to be getting a monthly sales report? Is it quarterly? How's that going to work? 
Um, so we do ask, like, in addition to giving updates on the game progress, um, we do ask that our creators give um, more of a window into what's happening on the budget and the timeline um, of things. And but it does go back also to you know choosing who we work with up front and people who have demonstrated capacity to uh, to deliver. Um, so you know, um, Obsidian is a great example of that. Um, by all measures, we have probably the most commercially successful crowdfunded game to date. Um, just done amazing, very highly rated. Um, you know, having having them on the platform, trusting them seems like a, you know, a, um, you know th that seems like a no-brainer for us. But um, but it's it's another reason why we don't see ourselves as competitors with Indiegogo and Kickstarter because hey, guess what? Um, you know, we can't have everybody on our platform. There are going to be games that, that that don't have a commercially viable component to them, like alt games, and like those make sense elsewhere. And then since we are a label, you know, we do we highlight everything's a highlight for us. We don't just you know cherry pick one or two. Um, and so because of that, we're not going to be able to take like every single project. It really seems like the challenge for you is going to be curating who you choose to work with. Yeah. And that, that really comes down to you and your team uh, vetting people. And I think that's going to be your biggest challenge going forward more than it's that. And then if you if somehow someone sneaks past that process, yeah. then dealing with the, 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 the damage. I think that's probably your biggest challenge right now. Right? We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit is like uh, what I don't want other than like finding out is there a quality bar um, and can people actually achieve this? I don't really want myself or, you know, like any person or one person, a team or even a gathering of us um, figuring out what are the, the, the things that are most interesting um, being because that's that's going back to the closed door of a publisher. Um, now, what we would like to do and we, we're, we're putting these in motion, we don't we're not going to talk about it just yet, um, but we want to get the community more involved in actually the selection process of the projects that are going to be on our site. That'd be great. I think you're going to uh, educate the community more, and that's probably why you're hiring a community manager, right? Yeah, I'm probably multiple community managers, actually. <laughs> awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time, Justin, and uh, good luck going forward. I think you're. I think you guys are on to something, and uh, I look forward to seeing how this platform evolves. It looks like you guys are really focused right now, but I do think opening it up to maybe influencers or websites in the games industry might be that first little step outside of what you're currently doing uh, but yeah I think I think you have a long runway because there's a lot of consumer products out there that you could do this with yeah yeah that's true but definitely just focus on video games right now so right on well keep doing it for Shaq News for the foreseeable future so um, thank you Kevin. awesome well, thank you very much